So we are now in our third week of a series that we're calling Sent, where we are considering together what it is to be the people of God. And what we've been talking about is how actually God himself is a God who is sending all the time. He sent his son, for he so loved the world. Um, His son sends the spirit. The spirit sends the church. And so we are, as the church, not just an institution or a building or a an organization, but we're actually a people who have been sent on a mission, the mission of God. We've been asking, what is that mission, and what is the shape of it? And um, we're doing that also in the midst of an exciting time in the life of our church, as we're preparing to send some of us uh, into a new community in the Charles Village area of Baltimore to, um, to start a new church community. And so we're taking this opportunity to think what does it mean to, be, to send people in God's name? And what does it mean to be sent, all of us, um, to be a blessing in the world? Two weeks ago, we saw that that is um, what God's plan, his mission was from the very beginning, was to, to bless all the peoples of the earth. And l- last week, we saw how s- s- part of the way that that happens is through blessing of our neighbors. And so to summarize where we've come Thus far, we've seen that the church is the people of God who have been sent to be a blessing in their communities and in the world, which is a highly non-controversial mission. It's uh, something everybody can get behind. Who doesn't want to get behind blessing? It's like a political platform that is primarily about ice cream and puppy dogs for all, right? Everybody likes the idea of blessing. But one of the things that seems to happen is that there's something between our, I, our lofty ideals and our pious um, thoughts and the actual um, embodiment of those things in real tangible expression. Something slips between our intentions and uh, the, the, the blessing that we are really supposed to be in the world. So we might ask, what is that in-between space between our good intentions and the good outcomes of blessing of our neighbors in the world? Um, What are we missing in between? And so this morning we're going to look at a beautiful letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to a group of Christians. He wrote it from a jail cell, and he wrote it to people who were experiencing difficulty, suffering, and opposition in their um, context. You can find it on page 1073 of the Red Bibles if you want to look there. It's Philippians chapter 2, and it's a, it's a beautiful and famous and wonderful text of Scripture, so I encourage you to take a look at it as we read. But before we read, let's pray and ask God to help us understand what we're going to read. Father, we're here to hear from you. We each come with our own burdens and joys into this room, our own distractions and concerns and worries and fears. But we want to pray that you would fix our eyes on you through your word this morning. We would ask you, Spirit, to to fill our hearts and direct our minds and our thinking and speaking and reading and understanding that we would know what you want us to know. And not only that we would know it in our minds, but that it would work itself down into our hearts and through our hearts out into our lives. Help us to understand what it means to be your people. Help us understand what we're called to and what is true of us because of your son, Jesus. We just ask that you would help us to see him this morning and that these words written down centuries ago would be brought to life by your spirit. And we believe you can do that because we're praying it in the name of Jesus, who is himself the word made flesh. And we know that he's here by his spirit. So we look to your word with expectancy and hope and pray that it would not return void, but would accomplish the purposes for which you send it. Amen. So if you look in Philippians 2, um, you'll see that it starts with the word therefore. And so... um, There's a thought that's continuing. And right before chapter 2, you can see Paul speaking to the experience of struggle that he and the Philippian 
audience that he's writing to are, are experiencing. He says, for it has been granted to you, in verse 29, interesting phrase, it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him. Since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. So I just want to say it's important to know that as we go into Philippians 2, we're, um, we're, we're entering into a context in which people are struggling. And this is a word to struggling people. And so if you're struggling this morning, it might be a word for you. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same attitude of mind Christ Jesus had, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a human being, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So we all know about this phenomenon that um, it's not just what you say, but how you say something that makes a difference in your communication. Uh, body language plays a, a huge part in um, understanding and misunderstanding. We experience this all the time, like the difference between somebody saying, thanks a lot, and thanks a lot, right? There's a difference. The words are the same, but the meaning is entirely different. Or like when, if somebody were to say, that is really interesting, as opposed to, that is really interesting, right? That one I get a lot, so that one came to my mind quickly. <laughs> but in communication, it's not just what you say, but it's how you say it. It's your body language that communicates or confirms or disconfirms the truth of the words and the message that, that you're trying to communicate. And I think what Paul is doing here is inviting the Philippian people Philippian believers, to think about their body language. Um, he begins in this first section to, to talk about the internal experiences that we have as people in our spiritual lives. And he says, if there is any good stuff happening inside of you, if there's any encouragement from being united with Christ, if you are experiencing comfort or a sharing in the Spirit or tenderness and compassion, don't let that stay inside, but let it work its way out in tangible expression don't just talk about it and thank God for it, but let it somehow take shape in your life and in your common life together. And, and he says then that what this results in are some, some very attractive and appealing things like unity of purpose and humility rather than selfish ambition and putting the needs of others before your own needs. It's really easy to look at this first passage and just think, man, if, if we all did that, if that was all the Bible we had and we followed that, this world would be a much better place. <laughs> if people were putting others above themselves and not seeking their own interests but the interests of others, that would take care of a lot of the problems we have in the world. That would be an enormous blessing. And yet, there still is kind of this lingering question. Okay, like we, like we asked at the beginning, we have this encouragement, these good things happening inside us because of what God is doing, and we, we know that this should work itself out in some kind of tangible expression in our lives, but, but what is that in-between place? What needs to happen in-between to make that blessing real and tangible? 
And so Paul goes on to put forward Jesus Christ as a kind of, as a kind of example, but more than example, a kind of definition of what, what happens between our good intentions and the real blessing that we are called to be in the world. And what he says, I think, is that the, that road from good, intention, good intentions to actual tangible expression of blessing is a, is a road that goes through sacrifice, is a road that goes through self-giving, is a road that passes through vulnerability. Because as he describes Jesus' life in this poetic and powerful way, he just describes a descent. <laughs> says, Jesus, being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used, but he made himself nothing. And it's almost like we're walking down this staircase deeper and deeper into the darkness as we're following Jesus on his descent from all that he was to all that he became for us. And one of the interesting phrases here is this idea of that he made himself nothing. You read that in one sense and you think, well, what does that mean that he made himself nothing? He made himself something. He made himself a man uh, from Bethlehem and Galilee. He was a carpenter in Palestine. That's something. This word ha- carries, also carries the meaning of he, he emptied himself. There's a couple ways to think about that. It's as though We can think about a cup being poured uh, out, a cup of water being poured out, but the mistake we might make is thinking about Jesus as the cup who somehow empties all the good stuff and is now empty himself. But maybe a better way to think about it is that Jesus is the water who is himself poured out for all of us. I think that's what is meant by this making himself nothing. He's, He's putting aside his rights, his, he does not take advantage of his nature as God, but actually as being God, as being the sending God, who is full of love and compassion, what he does as God is pour himself out for us, empties himself. His whole life is a, is a sacrifice. He goes from God to human to servant to obedient servant, even obedient unto death, even death on a cross, which at that time was not a necklace that you wear, but a place where criminals were executed. And so we just see this incredible descent from glory to shame. And we're reminded that this is how Jesus saves us. He saves us through through entering into our condition of vulnerability and frailty. From the nature of God to the nature of a servant, descending from the place of the God of life to the place of a dying, unjustly executed criminal, this is the shape of Jesus' mission. And it is shaped by sacrifice and vulnerability and gift. And that is why, because there is no gap between who Jesus is is and who he ought to be. There's no gap between his intentions and the effectiveness of his action because he is willing to walk this road of sacrifice. This is how Jesus saved us, not through speech only, not through just teaching us and telling us how to live better, not even through some kind of triumphant victory by which he conquered all his foes in a a way that, that was readily apparent, but Jesus wins by sacrifice and vulnerability. And so if this, if we're talking about the mission of God, then we can't ever forget that this mission of God involves vulnerability, an embracing of vulnerability, an embracing of risk, an embracing of sacrifice, a kind of self-emptying, a kind of self-giving that we are afraid of. We're afraid of this. Most of us spend all of our time, most of our time, shoring up our lives against vulnerability or against sacrifice. We might say with our mouths and not along with the sentiment that, you know, it's better to give than to receive or that a life lived for others is really the best life there is. But 
most of the time our body language, like the way we're actually living, tends to disconfirm the truth of what we say we value. Not the case with Jesus. This is why, by the way, um, if you're not a Christian and you look at the church and you say, uh, they don't look a whole lot like Jesus to me, this is a big part of the reason why. Because Jesus was willing to self-empty in, in vulnerable sacrifice, and we shrink back from that. But it's the same mission that we're called on, um, even though we tend to spend most of our lives trying to seek a trajectory that just keeps going up and up from sort of triumph to triumph. And we're actually concerned about a trajectory that looks like it's moving downward. But this is the shape of the mission of God. It has a sacrificial shape to it. It has a vulnerable shape to it. It has a kind of downward trajectory that looks like it might be heading towards defeat and disaster. This is how God has accomplished our salvations, by entering into that himself. So as we join God on this mission that he's calling us to, one of the questions we need to ask is, um, is about this re- the, the, the presence of vulnerability in our common life together or in our individual lives as, as followers of Jesus. Um, if our lives don't share any of the marks of vulnerability and sacrifice and gift, then we might need to ask ourselves how well we're matching up with the mission of God as it was revealed in the life of Jesus himself, the God-made flesh. I think one of the beauties of this moment in our church's life as we are preparing to send out a group of us to, to be a blessing to a new community in Charles Village, one of the great opportunities we have is to, is to allow Jesus to press us more into this mold of sacrifice and gift and vulnerability because it's going to be a sacrifice and we're going to have to give and it's going to hurt a little bit. We're already losing our favorite bald, bearded preacher and his delightful family and his beautiful kids, right? That's going to hurt. Your favorite Sunday school teacher might feel like God is calling them to go be a part of it. Maybe the sacrifice will look like you're feeling called to step up in a new way, to fill a gap that has been left. We're going to need to dig deep to support both of these churches with our resources. And so things are going to be different, and it's going to feel a little vulnerable probably. And what usually happens in our minds is that starts ringing some danger bells because we want our trajectory to be up and up, more, more bodies in the building, more more bricks in the building, more bucks in the budget. That's kind of the trajectory we're on. But we follow a Savior whose whose whole life was directed in the other trajectory, moving downward and lower for us and for our salvation. So even though we might feel like things are heading towards disaster, one of the opportunities we have to recognize is that, we, is that it's, a, it's a chance for Jesus to shape us more into his own image because we will have to give and we will have to sacrifice and we will have to be vulnerable and feel that, that place. Sacrificing gift is, is how God's people make the blessings that otherwise remain abstract and ethereal as how we make it real is by willing to enter in to vulnerability, sacrifice, risk, and self-giving. That's the middle point between intention and outcome. But I also want to say that um, the mission of God is, is for the whole world. It's broad, it's grand in its scope, but it isn't just um, broad, it's also deep. And it's also personal and individual. And so just as this Jesus-shaped life needs to be worked out in the body language of our body, um, it also needs to work itself out in our own personal lives as well. 
Because the mission of God is for the whole world, but it's also for our whole hearts and souls as individual people. And that's why this movement of Jesus down and further down and into greater depths of humility all the way to the cross, that's for us and for the depths of our need and for the depths and the dark places of our own hearts. And so, as we follow Jesus as individuals, I think our personal lives may well begin to take some of this shape as well. There might be places internally in our emotions, in our relationships, in our, in our feelings where, where God is opening up things that feel very sacrificial and feel painful. That being in that place of vulnerability is not a fun place to be. It's painful. And yet, this is the direction where Jesus goes on his mission. And so it's where his church goes, but it's also where he's going in our own hearts and lives. He's going down to the deepest, darkest places and making all things new there too. We don't need to fear this vulnerability because Jesus has already made himself vulnerable. We don't need to fear being undone because Jesus was already ripped apart for all of us. We don't need to fear even death because Jesus died that we might live. He's already gone to the bottom. And so when we feel like we're at the bottom, our Savior is there. That's where we find we need our Savior. In fact, not only are we not called to avoid this kind of life, which we all tend to naturally do, avoid a life of self-giving and sacrifice and vulnerability, but we're actually called to pursue it. I mean, Paul says to the people, and just remember that he's in jail and they're suffering, and he says, in your relationships with one another, have this same attitude of mind that Christ Jesus had. That, that attitude of mind, which then he describes as primarily sacrificial, <laughs> primarily a willingness to enter into the vulnerability and mess of life, that is supposed to characterize our own lives, so much so that we're supposed to pursue it and embrace that vulnerability and seek it, not to run from sacrifice and gift, but run to them as opportunities to discover the life that's really life. I had an interesting experience this week because uh, this text was obviously like bouncing around in my mind, and along with it, bouncing around in my mind, was the fact that we have some weird family stuff going on that's hard, and um, somebody came to me and asked me, could kind of tell that I wasn't okay, and was, said, are you okay? And I was immediately struck, probably because this was in the back of my mind, with my intense desire to uh, not be vulnerable. <laughs> my intense desire for, to, to stay on that imaginary road that just goes from triumph to triumph. I found myself painfully aware of my desire to have all of you think that everything is awesome in my life, that I am awesome and everything going on is awesome. That's primarily my objective. And I became aware of how I would much rather stand in front of a room of people and talk to you about how important humility is and talk to you about uh, how important vulnerability is and how important sacrifice is without actually ever walking that road myself which is a way of saying I would much rather just avoid the Jesus-shaped life. I would much rather stay in this illusion. But thankfully, God in his mercy had me working on this passage this week, and in his mercy, people who are even in this room wouldn't let that be a good answer. And so what I found was that um, I found an opportunity to let people come alongside and care for me and, and encourage and pray and and it was, it was a blessing that I would have missed if I had stayed on that illusion, illusion, illusionary road of self-sufficiency and competence. And it also gave me another insight into this passage, which I had never seen before, because I think when we hear about things like self-emptying and giving of ourselves and sacrificing and giving, we immediately think of ourselves as individuals and say, well, what about when I run out? What about when I run out of gas? What about when I run out of resources? What's gonna happen to me? And we start thinking about disaster 
and we become afraid. But this, this word that we're reading today is not written to in, an individual. It's written to a community of people. He's saying in your relationships with one another, in your life together, have this same attitude. And so the, the, the idea that the picture that's being painted is not just of, of individual people all alone just pouring themselves out like water from a cup, but a community of people who are pouring out and being poured into. If a community of people have the same attitude of mind as Christ Jesus, then when one person pours out, God, through his spirit, working through community, can pour back into that person. And so where there is a gap, God can fill that gap. And so part of the answer to the question of how, how, how are we going to be okay? How am I going to be okay if I, if I am vulnerable or if I give or if I sacrifice, if I walk this painful road? Part of the answer is um, God's people together, supporting one another and caring for one another. But it only works if we're all willing to walk and embrace this road of vulnerability and sacrifice. See, God saved us by embracing vulnerability. The church actually makes its blessing real through embracing vulnerability and sacrifice, and our own lives are transformed when we embrace vulnerability and sacrifice. That's what this beautiful passage of Scripture is trying to say, that vulnerability is not the end. Sacrifice is not the worst thing in the world that this is actually the way we're saved, and this is the way God works. And so for us to run from it is to run from God's working in our lives and in our community and in our own hearts. So if you look in your passage, you can see that there's uh, this verse has, it's kind of broken out a little bit interestingly. Um, scholars have suggested that this has been a, a song that um, may have even been sung uh, in its earliest in its earliest days, um, it's it's nice for me to think about this kind of painful passage of being a song that's sung. Um, but part of what we remember is that uh, the song doesn't end with the cross. The story doesn't end with the cross. It's actually Jesus' embrace of vulnerability that in, that that brings about this transformation, as as Paul says, um, he humbled himself. He became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him. It was through that um, acceptance of sacrifice and gift and vulnerability. It was, it was through that, not apart from it, not for some other reason. It was because, it was therefore, because Jesus self-emptied himself for us, God exalted him and gave him the name that's above every name. And so we remember that, that cro the cross is not the end of the story. And if we're following Jesus and we are his, then vulnerability and sacrifice isn't the end of the story for us too. It's actually the way to be shaped into his image and likeness. So there's a song I'd like us to listen to and reflect upon. Um, now, we, we start by reading a, what may have been a song in scripture about Jesus and about his descent and about his embrace of vulnerability. And there's a song that I want us to hear that will... Um, allow us to think about how that same dynamic works itself out in our own lives. So I want to invite uh, Mandy and John to come forward, and I want to invite you to think about, as you hear this song, just ask yourself, what are the, what are the places of sacrifice and gift? What are, what are, where are the places of fear in my own life? Where are the things that I am afraid to let go of? What is God trying to unmake in my life so that he can remake me? into something else. That's what the song is called. It's called The Unmaking. This is where the walls gave way. This is demolition. debris and all this dust what is left of what once was sorting through what goes and what should stay every stone I laid for you as if you had asked 
asked me to a monument to holy things empty talk and circling isn't that what we're supposed to do when now when all I've So what is it that we in our individual lives need to lose in order to find out who God really is? That's going to be a sacrifice. That's going to be vulnerable. That's going to be painful. But we are following a God who went all the way to the cross and was not defeated. Our God is the one who died and rose again. 
And so if there is anyone who can take the rubble of what needs to be unmade in our lives and remake it, it's the God that we follow. And so join us in this. This is what we're about. This is the mission of God. Not just to be covering the earth, but also to go, going all the way down into the depths of human need and being met there and found there and transformed there. Vulnerability is not the end. Sacrifice is not the end. Gift is not the end. If there's anything that the gospel of Jesus Christ tells us, it's that. That God's power is made perfect in our weakness. Let's pray. God, this is easy to say and hard to live. And so I pray that you would be gracious to us and kind and gentle and merciful to us, um, that you would lead us in ways that we know your nearness. We don't feel abandoned, but we feel you carrying us. Um, We want to be people who reflect your character and your love and your goodness in the world. And we know that oftentimes we avoid the very things that will bring us into greater, bring our lives into um, greater conformity with the shape of your life. So just keep Jesus in front of us. Let us fix our eyes on him, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross and scorned its shame, and is now seated on the throne of the universe, the one who came and died to redeem and save even us, and even the mess of our lives. Use us, not in spite of our weakness, but through our weakness, for your glory, and for the glory of your wounded, broken, but reigning son. We pray in his name. Amen.